Welcome to all of you. My name is Warren Kinghorn. It's really a delight to see everyone here assembled. I'm a co-director along with Far Curlin of the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative and want to just welcome all of you to our Practice and Presence Conference. Um, this is the third time we've held this conference, but the first time in September. Uh, we've done it in hot weather before in May, but this is the first time in the early, early fall, and uh, we're just really delighted that you're here. And I know this is a busy time of year with a lot of things going on, both at Duke and elsewhere. So the fact that you all have taken uh, your weekend to be here with us really means a lot. Uh, and so we just want to welcome you to this space. Um, welcome for those of you that have not been here and for those of you that have to Duke. Welcome to Duke Divinity School. Welcome to this space, Goodson Chapel. Welcome to Durham. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us this weekend. Uh, we this is an academic institution, as those of you that are students here know quite well, but this is not an academic conference. At least it's not only an academic conference. Um, we will be talking this weekend a lot about how, as, as those who are in some way related to health care, we focus our attention on those who suffer. What does it mean to walk well, faithfully, with those who are suffering and in pain? But this is a conference that's about more than ideas. Uh, as, we've, as you might have seen in some of the material for the conference, we, we said we want to tune our eyes and hearts to how God is present in the work of health care. We want to engage scripture, theology, Christian history, but also other ideas, other things that we'll talk about tonight and, and elsewhere, open to how our imaginations and our practices might be transformed. And we want to grow in friendship with one another in the context of shared meals and conversation and prayer and worship. And perhaps mostly we want to rest and reflect and respond to God's love for us and for our world. That's kind of a big agenda for 36 hours, but if even part of that is met, I'll be happy. And I'm sort of just welcome here. We're really delighted that you're here tonight, and I'm really excited about our evening. Um, I do want to, before I uh, introduce a few people and then introduce our speakers for the night, I do want to say one of our participants has had a car issue and uh, needs a ride to the Holiday Inn on Guest Road, which is a couple of miles north of here. If anybody's driving that direction after the conference, um, then find Rachel Meyer, um, who is somewhere, oh, Rachel's right here, and, uh, and just let her know that you're willing to do that. And, and um, the person who is I'm talking about, we will make sure that you get here um, no matter what. Um, I do want to just say thanks to a few people that are really involved with our, with our program tonight and in the background. We've already thanked Rachel before, but I want to say again thanks to Rachel for all of your work just kind of getting everything about this conference up and going. Carl Weissner is also here, who's our Managing Director for Theology, Medicine, and Culture in the back. And um, Rachel and Carl, as well as any of us here at Duke, are available to you for questions and other things throughout the weekend. And I want to acknowledge their really key central role in, this, in making this conference happen. Also, I want to really thank uh, Amanda Noel and Paige Capes, who are in the back here. And thanks you so much for leading us tonight. And you'll be back in the morning, and we're just so grateful for you all being here with us tonight. So thank you. Um, also, uh, Brittany Zeller-Holland will, uh, will be doing graphic recording on the, on the side, and really excited. This is a part of our plenary sessions this year, and uh, we'll see this unfold over the course of the conference, and so thank you for being here with us, and really excited to engage with you. And Hannah Elmore is here doing some photography, and so we want to thank you all for all of your role here in the conference. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker's guest for tonight. Um, I can promise you that I am the only person who will speak tonight using any form of notes, and so that's a good thing. You'll be glad for that. Uh, our speakers tonight are Jeff Polish and Ray Barfield. Uh, and the topic tonight is, I visited them learning presence on the pediatric oncology ward. And you're in for a really great conversation that I'm looking forward to sitting and hearing. I want to briefly introduce the two of them before they come up on stage. Um, Jeff Polish is a consultant, professional speaker on the topic of storytelling and how to use true stories to create major impact in your life, your business, your organization. He's originally from New York, but now lives here in Chapel Hill. He travels across the country uh, advising and speaking, but when he's not doing that, and those of you who are local in the Triangle area may know this, he produces and hosts the Monty Storytelling Events um, in North Carolina, and he's won all sorts of awards for this, and they're really amazing events. So it's a plug for your organization, if any of you are, are local and can attend some of the Monty events that are, that are going on. 
Um, and Jeff is also a trail runner and a mountain biker and, and a dad and a husband and does lots of other things. And we're just we're so pleased that you're here with us tonight. So thank you. And Ray Barfield is professor of pediatrics and Christian philosophy at Duke University Medical Center and Divinity School. He has like the coolest academic title in all of Duke University. So that's, pretty, that's a pretty good thing. Um, married to Karen Barfield, an Episcopal priest. And Ray is hard to describe in any kind of introduction. Uh, because he kind of blows all the categories that people have with him. So he's a pediatric oncologist. Um, he has done anything from basic science research to uh, oncology practice to starting the pediatric palliative care program here at Duke University Medical Center. He's a philosopher and he teaches philosophy here at the Divinity School and at, across Duke University. He's also a poet and a novelist and lots of other things that I have a hard time keeping track of. And he does it all without notes and always without a tie, which I really appreciate as well. So, <laughs> so we're, thank you so much. We're really glad to have you all here tonight. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. I wish I could watch her while she does that, but I'm going to behave. <laughs> um, I wanted to, we're going to talk about stories. And um, I, I'll add to the introduction of Jeff that he is the finest storyteller I have ever heard and has more insight into what makes a great story, which means that he has an amazing insight into the things that, that um, fill our, our best stories and that grab our attention, which means things that are important to us, and the things that matter to us as human beings, and things that hold up a mirror to us and show us things about ourselves that may be uncomfortable. Um, they may be welcome. It may be a mix. And so being a master storyteller means be, having a, a, a profound curiosity and engagement with everything that shows up in human experience. Nothing is off limits. And that means some pretty uncomfortable things show up. Um, I'm thinking of your weekend uh, in the shape of a story. Uh, and you never begin a story with, and they lived happily ever after. It's just not how you begin a story. You begin a story with a problem, with a conflict, with trouble. Something's wrong. So something's amiss. You don't come together um, to listen to a story that is only going to recite happy things when you have the word suffering in the title of your conference. <laughs> you know that you're coming to talk about some very real things. Now, um, you know, Jeff and I have, have had more conversations than I can count. Um, I am very grateful for his friendship. We go all sorts of different places, and we come from very different kinds of backgrounds, which, which makes our conversations quite interesting sometimes. Now, this is specifically a Christian um, you know, divinity school, and this is a Christian conference. And I wanted to just say a couple of things about that, because we're going to talk about stories, and we'll see what emerges. Okay. Um, but I wanted to start by causing some trouble, if, if that's okay, Far. Okay. Yeah, he did, you'll notice he didn't say it's okay. <laughs> anyway, there's not much he can do because we're up here already. Um, <clears throat> so as we were singing the songs, there's some very beautiful, very wonderful things in here. Um, for example, here's a verse. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Now, where I want to suggest some trouble is by leaning on the story of Jesus at the point where he is suffering on the cross. 
And he most assuredly offers a very deep encouragement to the person suffering next to him when he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. But not everything he says from the cross is when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. What Jesus says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So there's something complicated going on here. Now, as Christians, we know that what happened on Friday was not the end of the story. But the story of Jesus' death and resurrection is one that happened along the same timeline as the story that's going to unfold among you as you think about these difficult issues. And I can assure you that Friday was a troublesome day. It was a dark day. People were afraid. People were bewildered. They scattered. They lost their faith. They ran away. They wondered, hey, we were following this guy, and now look at him. He's dead. So I think that if we're going to be, if we're going to honor what actually shows up in the midst of suffering, and if we're going to come to deep and abiding responses that have integrity from inside the Christian community that's, that, that, that's present here, I think we're also going to have to be willing to spend some time with the uncertainty and the disorientation that many, many people who are actually suffering experience. And if we're not willing to dwell for a time in that uncertainty, it may be very difficult for us to show up with integrity, with true presence in the room of someone who's suffering. But I think the thing that this conference will move towards is the idea, the profound idea, that this is not the end of the story. There's more to the story. So I, I just wanted to frame this um, briefly before we talk about stories. And we're, gonna, we're, we're not theologians, and we're not even going to pretend to be. You know, sometimes I pretend to be, but it's the, <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to tonight. I'm not even going to pretend, because there's some actual theologians here. <laughs> I only pretend in a classroom where I'm the only one. Anyway, enough of that. This is, this is exactly what I'm not supposed to do. Far told me. Um, but, I, but I did want to frame it in that way. And I encourage you to hang on to that and allow yourself space to be troubled by the reason that this conference is so important. And allow yourself also to be open to moving towards, especially if you yourself are in the middle of, of a darkness or of a doubt or of bewilderment, allow yourself to be open to the possibility that there's a hope that we're moving towards, that the trouble itself is not the end of the story. But like every good storyteller, we do once upon a time, and then we turn to the trouble at hand, because something happened, and that's where we'll leave it tonight, and we'll see how your story unfolds through the weekend. So that, that's our frame, into frame. Is he in trouble? A little bit. <laughs> only, only. A little bit. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you talking. Um, so I, as, as Ray said, I'm the finest storyteller he's ever met. <laughs> I mean, he, I'm a storyteller, yeah. So I, I work in story, I tell stories, and I help people to find their stories and then tell them publicly. And um, so I understand the power of story as it pertains to individuals and communities and the joining of, of that together. But what, what I want to talk to you about, or at least start this conversation about, is that you're a physician, right? A pediatric oncologist you, who also understands and appreciates and practices story in your medical practice. But let's take that away for a second. What's wrong with just practicing medicine as is? What's wrong with 
walking in, meeting a patient, diagnosing that patient, and then healing their body, walking out. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Okay, next question. <laughs> um, the, the, this uh, isn't going as planned. Um. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. You know, there's, there is... Uh, it's, it's, so, so when someone does do that, they're doing an important, good service to someone. Um, and it's in the same category as the outstanding service that my mechanic does with my car. Um, I take my car in regularly and um, I love the mechanics that I work with. They're local, they're in Carborough, we have a relationship. Um, our conversation doesn't go terribly deep, you know? They, but they do important things to my car like make my brakes work keep my wheels going round and round. And that's important. Um, I think that if the human body and the human experience of a broken body were in the same category as a car and the experience of a broken car, which may be accompanied by some frustration, by, by you know, oh man, the time, you know, I mean, there's little things that can be accompanied with it. If it was in the same category, it might be perfectly fine to come in just like a, my mechanic does. And I have no gripe with my mechanic. Um, the problem that I have with that approach to medicine is this. And I don't believe that this is, that I'm making some kind of universal statement. I think that I'm making a culturally embedded statement. Because in our society, at least, we have over decades, <clears throat> built up the reputation of this thing that we call medicine as the place you go when things happen to your body, when you become sick. The place you go when you're having a baby, so a new life is coming into the world. The place you go when you're injured. It's the place you go when you have overwhelming depression or anxiety or schizophrenia, or something else that's disrupting your mental health. We set it up as the place that we go when we experience profound losses. And the reason that I have a problem with people approaching medicine as a mechanic is not that the mechanical parts of the service aren't things we should do well. And it's not that they aren't themselves valuable. It's just that our experience of our bodies and of their brokenness is very, very different than the description of what's happening to the bones and to the flesh and the sinews, to the molecules. My experience is very, very different. If I'm going to walk into a hospital where all of these experiences have been brought together um, under the auspices of some kind of authority that we have, some kind of authority to speak into these situations. And if we have put up signs that say that because I have MD on my badge, I have a special place in the room when these kinds of problems arise and you bring your loved one in to see me. And you have an expectation that I'm gonna respond well. Um, if I'm set up to respond to these kinds of complex experiences of illness, which are very different from the physical description of illness, but I am utterly unequipped. I have a front row seat. I have an invitation. I have assumed the mantle of authority. And I've walked in the room with no competence to um, respond to the truth of the room. And, and so I think the way that that would tie into our theme of storytelling, and the reason, honestly, Jeff, that storytelling, the more we talk and the more we think about these things and teach classes together, the more storytelling has become my placeholder for what is central to the practice of medicine with everything else in service to what emerges in the course of storytelling. 
The reason is because almost everything that I talk about in terms of my experience of loss, my experience of fear, my experience of hope, um, if we're making a decision and I'm trying to tell you how things are ordered in my life, what matters to me most, I may not be choosing between a good thing and a good thing. I may be choosing between a difficult thing and a difficult thing, and you must understand something about my story in order as the authority to help me walk that path. So to have spent no time developing a competence in storytelling seems to me negligence. And it seems to me as our ICUs fill up with people who have not been thought not been offered a chance to think beyond the mere mechanical response to what's happening in the body. I believe that it's malpractice to be unable to negotiate a story or to recognize when the elements of a story are the most important thing happening in the room right now. That they're the most important determinant of how a decision is going to evolve. And that's frequently the case, and especially in high-stakes situations like intensive care units, where end-of-life sorts of things come up frequently. So I, I, um, I think that it is understandable why people neglect this, because I believe the system as a whole, including the entire education system and the way that we remunerate and the things that we hold in high value, the entire system has neglected this aspect of suffering. And so if we come through as medical students and nursing students and PA students, it, maybe it's not surprising that we have not been offered the tools, that we have not grown, that we've not matured in this area. Maybe it's not something that we would simply point to an individual and say, oh, you ought to be better at that. Maybe this is a systemic thing. But in any case, I think it's still unfortunate and the one place where I would say that an individual holds responsibility is if they have, um, if they have decided that they simply don't care about that aspect of experience. Um, to me, that is either a sign of um, a, a kind of, of, of spiritual or psychological um, maybe immaturity or maybe, maybe a certain kind of, of smallness, of worldview. Um, it may also be a sign of moral injury. It may be that someone has come to a place because of the nature of their training. And this training that I'm talking about, this is 80 hours a week for 10 or 15 years. That's a lot of training. That's a lot of your conscious experience for a decade, right? So it may very well be moral injury. This is another thing that I hope y'all are able to talk about as you wrestle with why this is such a problem these days. Um, but that's why I think there's a big difference between simply walking in the room and treating things the way that my mechanic does and walking in the room and actually being able to see the truth of the room, especially as high stakes decisions come your way and you're, you're asked to be a guide. You know, um, and you heard me uh, tell this story actually in class. So we teach a class together called Storytelling in Medicine and Health. And I recently, when, when we started the course, we were trying to just intro why stories are so important. And I told this story about my father-in-law, where five years ago he had a colonoscopy. It was routine. Uh, he had a polyp removed, and that polyp was cauterized, and he was fine, sent on his way. And about a week later, he's out with some friends, um, you know, just having a good time. Uh, earlier that day, though, he had taken a couple of aspirin. And uh, he's out with some friends that night, and he's sitting there, and he has this sudden urge to use the restroom. He goes to the bathroom, and he sees blood in the stool. And he, at first, he's kind of like, oh, maybe it's just... Maybe he ate something, I don't know, whatever. Um, but so he goes back to his group, hanging out, uh, and then he has a sudden urge to go to the restroom again, goes to the bathroom, it's the same thing, and when he's on his way back to the, uh, see his friends, he actually passes out. Uh, his friends find him, uh, 911 is called, he's taken to the hospital. And, you know, that one week after, you know, the colonoscopy where, you know, that uh, polyp is removed is a particularly 
um, delicate time because whatever scab may have formed around that that um, injury, if you say, um, may have come off and the blood thinner didn't help, and well, this is what happened. So he was bleeding out in some way. So he's in the hospital and he's getting great medical care. Uh, his wife is informed, she comes, she brings his personal effects, she's giving him the care that he needs as well. And I find out that he's in the hospital the next morning because. My mother-in-law called all of her daughters, and then finally my wife told me the next morning, and I immediately said, I'm going. They live in Greensboro, which is about 50 minutes from where I live, so I'm like, I'm going. I'm the only one in the family, in the next generation, that has a flexible job that allows me to basically pick up and go to Greensboro. My parents actually don't actually believe I have a job, so, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I drive, I drive to Greensboro, and while I'm on the way, I think, what is it going to be like to walk in the hospital room where I see my father-in-law, who is a huge role model for me? I mean, this man taught me how to be a man, uh, a husband, a father. He was a huge influence on me and very important. And I didn't know what it would feel like to see him in bed. So I parked at Moses Cone Hospital walk into the hospital, go up the elevator to the room, open the door, and see him lying there. Now, he's lying there reading something. He looks up when the door opens, sees me, and starts crying. I mean, like, sobbing, weeping, like just as, as deep a cry as I've ever seen from another man. And the thing is... Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you that my mother-in-law was there, too, and when he started crying, she was like, oh. <laughs> she's a wonderful woman, but she's not dealing with that. So she's like, oh. And she gets up, and she walks up to me. She gives me a hug, thanks me for coming, and she's out of there. <laughs> she's great, though. She would not appreciate these comments, but uh, anyway, that's what happened. So the thing is, is that... She'd be a good cardiologist. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> The thing Keep is, going. I was not surprised. I mean, I didn't expect it, but I wasn't surprised when it happened. I wasn't surprised that he started crying when he saw me. Be I'm, a lot of people cry in front of me, I will tell you that. It's, it's an occupational hazard. But, so, but I wasn't surprised because I was able to tell in that moment that when he saw me, he knew that he was, going to, he was about to receive the care that he had not received yet, the type of care, and the type of care that he desperately and profoundly needed. Sure, the doctor was there to, to help him, to bring him back, to, to heal his body. His wife was there to take care of all of the logistics, but nobody had taken care of him emotionally. And when he saw me, like, he, he knows me. Like, he knows that I'm a sensitive listener. I'm a, I mean, I'm a great listener. You're fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, I mean, he knew what to expect from my presence. Um, he knew that I would sit with him and that I would listen to him and that I would listen without judgment. And I would understand and I would interpret what he was saying. And it would give him the emotional support that he needed. He needed somebody to, to sit and listen to the fact that in the past 30 years, he had never been to a hospital because of his own illness. He'd been to the hospital for other people's illnesses, deaths, births of grandchildren, etc., but he had not been admitted to the hospital on his own. And this was, this was really getting in his head because he is the patriarch of that family. He has provided and he takes it very seriously. He, he, he's a role model for me and the others in the family and he sees himself as this, this pillar. And now he's weak and he's sick and he needs to tell somebody that's going to listen. 
And, and I was there. And at no point did I ever say to him, stop crying. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Stop. It's okay. Fine. It's going to be fine. You know, because the thing is, there's nothing wrong with him crying. There is nothing wrong with him expressing his true self to me and for me to bear witness to that. And I walked out of that room that day um, thinking that I had provided him with a major and serious and profound service and the type of care that he deserved. And perhaps that should have been provided to him before I even arrived. Um, but I'm for hire, you know, if you ever need me to walk into your hospital room. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, that's almost exactly the kind of thing that I think of when I think of a disruptive beginning to a story. Because in a sense, you know, the background, the thing that's not going to be the movie is his 30 years of being a pillar, right? Mm -hmm. That's the background. That's what happens every day. This is what happens every day. The pillar. He's always, he's the one who comes and serves. He's the one who does this. And where the movie begins, where the story begins, where the novel begins, where the story around the campfire begins, where what your story is, is, and then this pillar uh, was afflicted. This thing came into his life. Now, it's describable. It's describable through the technical aspects of colonoscopy. It's describable through the pathology of the polyp. It's describable through all of the um, descriptions of the coagulopathy and the evolution of it and its relationship to heparin and all of these other things. Of course it is. But what's actually happening in the room <clears throat> is that the pillar of the family has now encountered an interruption and is in need. And what the pillar of the family is coming to terms with is something that uh, he's never publicly had to come to terms with, which is the limits of any man, any woman. And coming up against these limits is a kind of self-knowledge that can be difficult to embrace. It's a hard kind of knowledge to accept. I think there are a thousand variations on this interrupting event that can occur. This is one of the thousand kinds of interruptions that can occur. But <clears throat> acknowledging this, bearing witness to it, is something that you were able to do. And this is one of those things where in a family, where there is someone who can bear witness to this, then the person has a resource. The person will not be alone in the interruption. One of the things that I've noticed, though, as a physician who is very often present at the moment of disruption, and who even is the deliverer of the news about the disruption, they may not know that their life's been disrupted yet. And I come in and I say, well, um, I do have some news. And I am aware that when I finish talking, their life is going to be completely different. And so not every family, and I say this as a, a, as a, a, a fairly robust understatement, has the resources, the community, the forethought, the practice to respond to disruption. And many, many families, many, many pastors, many, many doctors, many, many well-meaning people have in their toolbox, they open their toolbox, a disruption has occurred, and, and all that they have is, um, is well, um, you know, every, everything's going to be okay. Or here's, here's an encouraging word, I love encouraging words. But if a person's at a point where they need to sob because they've encountered a new reality, I am limited, I am broken, I cannot be the pillar right now. I've always been the pillar. I don't know how to not be the pillar. 
What, I mean, what happens now? I don't know the next step. I am lost. I'm, I'm lost. Well, if a family doesn't ha- know, know what to do with that, and we've positioned ourselves um, as nurses and as physicians and as chaplains and as whoever has the authority to walk into these rooms that say no admittance on staff only, um, I think that apart from whether or not we should have transformation of medical school curricula or anything like that, I'm not even talking about that right now. I'm just talking about the spiritual reality uh, of my journey as, as a physician. Um, do I or do I not want to be capable of bearing witness to that moment? Even if I don't have the time because I, my clinic slots are 20 minutes each or, or what have you, I've got 10 more people to see in the emergency room, I've got chemo to write, whatever the thing that we want to say. What, you can change the story however you want. But in a moment, do I want to be the kind of person who can recognize that there is another thing in the room besides the pathology information about the polyp? besides the description of the coagulopathy, besides the technical aspects of the colonoscopy, um, to fail to see that in this room there is an important event occurring. It matters in the life of this person. It matters in the life of this family and this community. And if I cannot see it, then I am failing to see something important. Well, I want to be the kind of person who can see that. But one of the problems with becoming the kind of person who can see that is that you then have some obligation to respond to that reality. And so I want to become the kind of person who has wisdom in the area of responding to that reality, having seen it. But that's hard. And that that hardness is part of the trouble that we want to sort of put out there for y'all to continue to ask the question, well, okay, fine, but how? (laughs) Well, that's a good question, and an important one. Um, so that's, that, that's exactly the kind of story I'm talking about, that disruption, right, that brings this entire conference into focus for me when we ask about the question of, okay, presence. What is presence? What do we even mean by presence, concretely? Yeah. And so, you know, you have s- spoken a lot about physicians and the mental health of physicians in the practice. And you have said, you have cited a figure that says that uh, you know, 50% of doctors report a um, significant amount of burnout in their profession, which means that they're not happy with their profession, with their jobs. And like, one of the things that you have said is that perhaps it's because of the fact that many physicians don't feel that connection with their patients, or that perhaps they don't have the time or the agency to process the, the things that they see, that they are in need of telling or developing their own story about their work in a place of illness and suffering. Is that, is that how you see the, that issue of burnout? Um. Well, so I, I think of burnout, and I, I, think, so I think burnout is a placeholder for something that is important and relevant to the discussion of presence and suffering. And, and here's why. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what exactly burnout is. Um, I think it's a, it's a word that, um, that needs, it's not self-evident. It needs to be populated. And it it needs to be populated carefully. Because whatever it's pointing to is a complicated problem. It's a problem that a lot of times in theology, medicine, and culture, when we're talking about some of the difficult problems that 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 um, that that group addresses, we call it a wicked problem. You know, we just borrow it, steal it from the business community. It's a wicked problem, one that's so hard that you have to begin to try to solve it and fail and then figure out why you failed 
in order to even understand the problem well enough to come up with a second iteration of, okay, well, now we understand it better. Now we can come up with a better response. It's that deep of a problem. Um, I think that there have been some changes in medicine that have um, moved us toward a concept of efficiency that is much more fitting um, if the model of the body as a machine, end of story, full stop, were true. If the body is a machine, full stop, then I think that the kind of efficiencies that corporations try to build into systems make a lot of sense. But if at the Ford factory, for example, all of a sudden, all the cars in the factory line became sentient and capable of suffering, so that every time the, the, the machine went it screamed. There would be a lot of concern in the Ford factory <laughs> that certain unexpected needs on the part of these sentient cars were not currently being met. It would be newsworthy, and there would be protests that evolve, and things would need to change. And so I think that when we talk about burnout, what we're talking about is um, why, why are these people that we have asked to, we've given them a intimate access to our stories, to our bodies, to things that might shame us, you know, to our blemishes, to our, 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 our inability to function in important ways. It may be an inability to see, oh, well now I can't drive. You know, it may, be, it may be impotence, something that's deeply related, you know, to our identity. Um, it may be, you know, breast cancer and, and losing something important about my body that, 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 that changes fundamentally my identity, but I can't talk about it. I'm not going to go to church and say, yeah, you know, my breast is going to get cut off and this really bothers me because my breasts are important to me. How do you, where do you talk about that? But you know what? It's true. Um, Augustine knew it was true. Augustine pointed to small things to point out how important they were. I mean, he basically, he said in the middle of the city of God, you know, it's a book, it's like that. Um, he's got this little place where he says, um, you don't think small things matter? I'll tell you what, shave off one eyebrow. <laughs> and then walk around and see how your day goes. See if you think about anything other than the absence of your eyebrow, right? It's just a little bit, there's nothing. It's a little bit of hair. It's a wisp. Nothing. Nothing. So burnout is if we're placed in positions where there are these delicate but vital forms of fragility, vulnerability, please, from people, to be seen and not shamed, to be seen in reality so that they can take their mask off and do it trusting that you are worthy of this trust, right? So if we put people in a place where that's the gift that, this, that, that, that me as a patient, that I'm giving to you as my doctor, um, but you're placed in a position to function with maximal efficiency that's more appropriate to a machine, then you're placed in a genuine crisis. If you're trained to do nothing but take care of the machine, but my thing I'm doing is showing you, Dr. Jeff, like, here's my, here's my fragility, right? And you're like, whoa, whoa, we don't do fragility around here. Really? You don't do fragility around here? Guess what, bud? You are the only one who has like legal permission to bear witness to certain kinds of fragility, right? So you better know something about what to do with it. And so we begin to feel this like disconnect between the role that we're asked by patients to play, the role 
that patients want to play is very often, I think, the role that we envisioned for ourselves. And then we find ourselves 10 years down the training in an institution that has a completely different set of priorities that fit a completely different model of the world, a machine, mechanical kind of view of the world and of the body. And the skills that we've been given are the skills um, that were decided on by a series of schools that have bought into that kind of model. And then there we are, we close the door and all of a sudden this person is asking for something that we are utterly unprepared for. And so I, I think that there are things like that. I, don't, I wouldn't reduce the problem of burnout or moral injury or whatever you want to call it to just that. That to me is the flavor of the crisis. And the reason I say it's so relevant to this issue of suffering and presence is that I think it's these kinds of things that break my radar so that I can't pick up the signals in the room. It may be that, and, and I learned this from social workers, nurses, and chaplains, who, who, whose radars were, are working, and, and who apparently have felt or sensed or seen or heard something in the room that I just missed. And when they get to know me, um, they know that I invite critique, and that I want to know if I have missed something. Um, and they, many, many of them have taken, <laughs> taken me up on that offer. Um, and so I've been on the receiving end of quite a bit of criticism. But it's been so helpful, painful, but helpful. Um, and it's, it did, 10 years ago, lead me to a different kind of question. How can I repair my radar? How can I acquire skills that I don't yet have so that I can respond when I pick something up? Um, I believe that if we addressed more of those kinds of things, that we would be at least on our way to addressing this issue of, of burnout, but I think we would also be on our way to addressing the kinds of questions this conference is, is asking. So how do you walk into a room where there's great suffering and establish presence? How do you find the courage to remain when you have no words to say? no idea how to fix a thing, and where your first inclination until you gain a, until you gain a maturity in this is, is to leave because it's uncomfortable. Um, I think that, that, that both of those things will be answered like side by side. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, you know, as a non-physician, but friendly and friends with one, um, I... I, it, this sounds so so familiar because the the world that I live in is I mean the most of the, the the things that I do in this community is I gather people just like anyone in this room and I listen to their stories and I help them to interpret the things that they've been through and I train them to deliver that story in a public forum in front of a room full of hundreds of people, strangers, right? So you've got this person standing on a stage telling a story that reveals so much vulnerability, so many dark moments in their lives, some very funny moments in their lives, but also things that they've learned. And talking to a room full of people who have no idea who this person is. They didn't come to see this person. They just came because they felt compelled to. Like, people are telling true stories about their lives. Like, what? So they show up, and all of a sudden, the story that they're hearing and listening to is familiar. In fact, they see themselves in that story. In fact, they, that is their story. There is this transfer what was once yours is now mine, mixed with the context of my life experience. And the mission of the organization that I run is um, we create community through the telling of stories. And that happens every single night, where all of a sudden we've pr produced this program with the number of storytellers, and people come up to me and they say, 
oh my God, like, I didn't know what I was coming to, but thank you so much for this. But they don't, the thanks to me is, is the minor part. The thanks to the storyteller is the bigger part because those are the people who are connected. You know, they don't really know each other and yet they do know each other. And the thing is, is that in this day and age with technology and social media, um, we're connected, you know, in Instagram, Facebook, all this stuff. Like, it's amazing to see your Disney photos. Love those, by the way. And, like, that's incredible. But, like, is that real connection? Do I really know your story because I saw those photos? No. Um, and so people are compelled to show up to this event where things get real, right? And the connection that they feel is not just nice and lovely. It's a necessity. It's a lifeline. This connection between two people, actually one person and then hundreds of people, but really two people, um, it's so essential to our very being. Doctor and patient, there is a required connection that should be there, but oftentimes it's not. And I think that both sides lose, it seems like to me, if there is no connection there. And, you know, the other thing is, going back to the doctor um, question, and we've talked about this quite a bit, is that um, what, does a, what does a physician do when the outcome with their patient is not favorable? The child that they've been treating dies, and then it's off to the next patient. And you know that. You know this situation. What, does a what is a physician to do? Where is the processing? Where is the generation of your story figuring out what just happened? Because a story is actually not what many people think it is. A story is not just what happened. It's what it means. What does it mean to you that you lost that patient? And do you have the opportunity to process that loss? Well, you, the, yes. no, <laughs> um, yes, no, yes. <laughs> Thank you. The, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a philosopher and we value clarity. <laughs> so now you're in the Yeah, yeah, so are y'all. <laughs> At least far. You know, your point is one that I'd like to um, explore a little bit. So there is, no, there is no process that I was offered myself in my training. Um, no process to, um, to, pro, you know, to, to, to work through difficult things. And you know, death is not the only form of loss. Um, I have vivid Im images of physicians who have given me permission to grieve other forms of loss by grieving themselves. Um, I, I, one of my images is, came during my oncology fellowship, and there was this, um, this orthopedic surgeon who I, I admired greatly uh, for his skill and for his kindness. And he, I, I had a patient who uh, had to have an amputation because of a bone cancer. And, and so he, in, in the operating room, um, with uh, a, the beauty of his craft, um, took off her leg and you know, sewed her up and did all the things that he had to do to prepare for a prosthesis and to make that process good. So he was thinking ahead, thinking very much about bones and skin and articulation and angles and those sorts of things. And when he had finished, he went and he leaned against the metal table that was up against the wall and he lowered his face into his hand and he began to weep. You know, I want to cry, cry right now, just thinking about 
his sense of what had just occurred in the room with this 15-year-old girl who will now have to ask questions like, will anyone ever want to marry me? Will I ever be able to have babies? Questions that are, uh, that are as large as our conscious world. Huge questions, questions that follow you around, haunting questions. He was aware of this. And I'm quite sure that later his interactions with her were favorably uh, impacted by his compassion. But I will tell you that he also would have been um, spiritually injured or, or would have had a history of spiritual injury if he had failed to recognize the whole truth of what's in the room. But then what do you do with that? Well, now, I, I knew him well enough to know that he had a way of working through things. And, of course, the beginning of working through a difficult thing is telling the truth about it. That by itself is hard enough. There are approaches that are um, formalized and, um, and described in terms of steps. Expressive writing, for example, is one that people are testing. Um, to provoke people and to give them tools to do something that we have forgotten how to do. Which is to pay attention to what just happened but to do so in the context of time constraints. And so there are tools that, that a lot of us are thinking about um, teaching to people, along to medical students, that's who I deal with. When I say medical student, that's my placeholder for anyone who is gonna be walking into this setting, whether it's a chaplain or a nursing student or a PA or a respiratory therapist or whatever. But to, you know, ways of, of, of processing, I think this is important, but I think it's something that has to be practiced. You, like anything else, you learn it over time. Um, why aren't we doing this in the first year of medical school? It's why we just started a program um, that theology, medicine, and culture is involved in and some other groups around campus to try to approach undergraduates who are interested in going to medical school and begin there. They can't begin developing the skills of, you know, surgery or something, you know, we can't let them try their hand at taking out someone's temporal lobe, but we can begin to teach them practices that by exercising these, they may not even know what they're going to be good for. Oh, hey, yeah, look at this, I'm doing that, you know, they may not even know. But then when they hit that first room where they see a thing that they do not have the the, 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 the experience or the language or the concepts or, or the, the ex anything to deal with, what well, we've, we've offered them some ways uh, to not simply do what I was taught, which is buck up, buddy. Move to the next room. And don't you ever forget that weakness is despised. It is absolutely despised. Um, that's a terrible way to form people. Now, there are very few people who are actually going to be attending physicians on the ward who are going to look at their resident and say, weakness is despised. That's part of what we mean by the hidden curriculum. It's the thing we don't say explicitly, but that is nonetheless profoundly formative of the way we view ourselves as people, the way we view our interactions, and the way that we view the people that we're caring for. And as you can imagine, if part of the hidden curriculum is that weakness is despised, and that processing these things, or weeping, or what have you, is, is, a, is a manifestation of weakness, um, well, it's at least worth a conversation whether or not someone who is formed in that way can be trustworthy when they walk into the room with someone who is weak, vulnerable, sick, not on their A-game, in a gown, you know? The, uh, 
the, the vice president of, you know, of you know, company X who's laying in bed with a Foley catheter or wearing Depends for the first time. Having a 24-year-old nurse come in and wipe his butt because he can't do it himself because of a neuropathy, right? What is our attitude, what is our real attitude toward people who are ill, who are weak, if we literally despise weakness in our lateral colleagues and in ourselves? So as you continue to talk about this issue of presence and suffering, um, there's no way for it to not circle back around to questions about ourselves. And we begin by telling the truth. I'm a cancer doctor, and I will tell you that no one has ever been cured of cancer by not actually naming it at the front end. If I pretend like you don't have cancer, you're not very likely to be cured, right? And I think that's the level that we're dealing with. Um, the one other thing I would say related to the Monty, which I find to be, I will, I will have to tell you, the first time I went to the Monty, someone said, I mean, basically they said, hey, would you like to pay $20 to go to this place so that you can stand and listen to five strangers tell stories? And I thought, why, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> And that, that's my career. Thank you. <laughs> but I went anyway. I could not believe it. First of all, it was standing room only. Hundreds of people packed into this place. You could not squeeze your way in. And they passed the hat. Right? People put, I want to tell a story, you know? And then, and then these five people got up. And um, what's interesting, there's, there's a bunch of interesting things about it. Um, and I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna actually relate it to the particular kinds of communities that this group specifically deals with. Because um, something happened in that room. Um, there was, we wanted those people to tell the truth. We wanted them to tell their story and to tell it well. And we were together with them. All of us were together. I didn't know anybody else there except for the one guy that, I, that, that, that had dragged me there. And we were all together in that. And they got up and they were nervous, and, but they knew we were there for them. We, want, we, were there, we were all doing this together, even though they, they were doing the speaking, you know? I'll tell you that patients, when they need to say hard things, when they need to tell a true thing about themselves, um, that moment when you've been, you know, sort of treating them for a sinus infection or adjusting their Lasix or, you know, bumping their insulin up a little bit and, you know, you're done with your, your, your and you're about to leave and you recognize there's something, there's something in the room that has not been said. And at that moment, you know, you, you, you earn your, your, uh, your little, your star, your healer's star, your shaman star, your village wise person star, your oh please help me do this more often star, show me how to do this star. Because you close the door and you say, I, I just have this sense that there's something else on your mind. And um, since it didn't come up, um, it tells me this is probably hard to say. Uh, and you gauge. Do you need to encourage them? Or do you need to just say, this is probably hard to say. Just wait. Mm -hmm. Until they can find the courage to say it. So by thinking about presence um, in a way that incorporates even the subtle feeling that changed in the room for those five seconds that I was just silent, right? Whatever that was, wh whatever that was, um, you know, taking things like that and saying, okay, well, let's pay attention to that. That is a way of shifting culture so that maybe medical culture can learn something from the culture at the Monty, where everyone is together saying, we're here. Yeah, tell us your story. The other interesting thing about the Monty 
is that you have this, uh, this hippo sound <laughs> that starts going off <laughs> when you hit the end of your story. Uh, Far has thought about using it whenever I'm asked to talk. <laughs> exactly. And the important thing about it is that um, you, your stories are about God, abortion, death, sadness. I mean, you, you go after the hardest things that humanity faces and say, we're telling a story about this. This is our theme. And you put a time limit on it. And very often, you know, people would say, oh, but this is like the most important thing ever. How can you put a time limit on the most important thing ever, you know? But there is, there is something, there is a reality that uh, time is limited. We can only stay awake so long. So limits are okay. That's something I learned from the Monty. A lot can be done in a short period of time if you have a certain wisdom and preparation about how to use that time. That's a thing that we could think about uh, in a very different way than the kind of corporate efficiency oriented towards maximizing time in order to generate high numbers of RBUs. We could think about how to use time the way the Monty does. We don't have to have a hippo sound, but we can certainly have the nurse who's like, bam, 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 Ray, you've got five more patients. I have that all the time. I need that. So learning how to do that, that's a skill. Another thing y'all could talk about, because that kind of practical skill is a part of practicing presence in the middle of suffering, given the reality that I also need to go home and eat dinner. That at some point my spouse needs to see me. That I need to go to sleep. That you have things to do. Yeah, you've got cancer, but guess what? That's not all you're doing. You don't just sit around having cancer. You also have to do stuff. So I, I've learned, so the last thing I want to say about the Monty that I've learned about that I think is really interesting, I think the church could learn a lot from this, because um, that's where a lot of people, I think, in this conference, they, they have an advantage, one advantage over the money. Now you have, you have a whole, you have hundreds of groupies, you know, who just follow you around, and I'm aware of that. And actually, that is a, people recognize each other, you know, so there are, there are the regulars. But at church... Um, what's interesting to me, and it's a place where I think the church hasn't used this very well, um, but we come together every week, you know, in a storytelling venue, and we certainly tell the story, and we sing hymns about the story and things like that. But I'm just wondering if there's an, another thing that you might talk about as the story continues for these 36 hours, from Friday to Sunday, as you move towards the, 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 the last part of the story, Right? is the question, well, are we using our Sunday, our, Sunday, our Sunday mornings well? We certainly need to ask questions about whether we're using our 15 minutes in the room well. That's what we've been doing, you know, as we talk about burnout and the importance of stories and decision-making and so forth. But I think the question could be asked about Sunday morning, too. Are we connecting links that are actually leading us over years of practice as a community to know what to do? Um, and I'll tell a quick story uh, about that sense of knowing what to do, because this is an important part, I think, also of practice and its connection to being present in, in suffering. Um, I, a while back, I had this, this uh, really sad situation where this baby, the same month old, um, through a series of things, um, ended up having um, hypoxic damage to the child's brain and there was no function, was brain dead. It was very, very sad. Um, I watched this family. This family, who was Latino, knew what to do. Now, the, the agony was, was mind-bogglingly intense because of the circumstance and the nature of the loss. But they had their community in the room as they moved towards decisions about withdrawing the ventilator, about organ donation, about things like that. They were Catholic, they had their priest in the room. And they had all the children from, of the cousins and the other family members around the bed where this little baby was and they were all coloring. While the priest 
spoke words from out of their Catholic tradition, from out of their story, that were important words to speak in that setting. And then they made the transition to organ donation. And as I watched them, there was a lot more that happened in there that would take a long time to tell. But as I watched them, I thought, that's what a story-shaped community looks like. That is what practice will do, where there is the, it doesn't take away the sadness of the situation. It's not something that sort of is a, a quick fix that turns everything into happiness by any means. The sorrow is in the middle, but the sorrow has a place, right? They know how to gather around and they know the story to tell. Um, it was some, really something to watch. So I don't know, it's just a question that I have for people who are thinking in, in these kinds of communities. So we can have this conversation for hours. Okay, and let's yeah, let's do it. And we will continue this um, on our own. But um, I'm curious if anyone has questions for Ray or me or. St. Jude's, which is where I started my career, um, is that you not only need to listen, but you need to sit down. Because when you are standing, you are indicating that you are on your way out the door and that there's simply a blip in the right heart. When you sit, you have their full attention. And I find that when I go visit parishioners, I'm a parish nurse, and when I go visit parishioners, I walk in the room, I greet them, and I sit down, and I get comments. You know, I like it when you visit. The pastors don't sit. They're really busy. And so part of that listening needs to be sitting, even if it's only for three minutes because then you're on their level for one thing. You're not looking down on them in the bed or wherever they are, but, but you're face on. And I agree, we haven't been teaching this. I think nurses started teaching this before MDs did, no offense intended, but I, I, I saw it in my practice. Um, but there is a gap. And I was thrilled tonight to plop myself down at a table full of pre-med students, introduce myself and hear their stories um, because they were all sitting together without the intergenerationalness that I saw everywhere else. So I stuck myself in. <laughs> um, but as far as questions go, I, I'm totally unfamiliar with the, the storytelling program that you have, so I want to talk to you later. Oh, okay. Uh, can I add something about the, um, the sitting part? So that's a great example. Um, so so and there's a play. So this is, um, there, there's a, once again, there's a, I think there's a hundred things like this uh, that, that, that I would encourage y'all to talk about. So take sitting. So there are things that show up at the level of technique, and that's very useful. And so I can tell a medical student, hey, you know what? When you go in and you're talking about something difficult, why don't you sit down? And then, and then they'll sit down and the effect will be better because they're sitting down. That's one level of thinking about sitting. But if you are um, trying to drill down to, well, why does it, why does it make a difference? Um, and you begin to think about the difference um, between what it is to be a patient and what it is to be caring for a patient, and you take that seriously, uh, that's going to lead your thoughts into a kind of deeper appreciation of things that we sometimes forget. It's a reminder every time we sit down. I am sitting down because there is an important thing occurring here. Uh, there's, an, there's another thing that I'll give you just as an example. I think we could, again, spend the whole evening talking about just sitting down. Um, but another thing that you could talk about with sitting down is that when I'm, you know, looking at, at Carl, um, there's, there is, I am, Carl may be sick and I may be Carl's doctor today. Tomorrow it's me in that bed. And so I am, I am in the role of physician caring for Carl who today is ill. 
But there is something very important about remembering that um, this role that I'm playing, I play gladly and I try to play it very well. And by role, I don't mean something superficial. It's a fundamental part of who I am, how I identify my walk on this earth. But at the same time, there is this very deep reality that I too am human and that I will be there someday. And so that's a, another way of framing the simplest gesture, sitting down, right? What do we remember when we sit down? And, and you can think about it in all, and everything else that you, whatever you talk about, it could be the kind of language you use, you know? Do you use Latinate, distant kind of medically kinds of words? Or do you talk like you're talking to your grandma? You know, right. a lot of things. Right, having been a patient a lot myself, and a nurse, I've seen it from both sides. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the things that I key off of. Time for a couple more questions. I just have to share quickly a story that happened to me this week. I, I'm a doctor working in the Duke system. We just moved to a new clinic, and it's a beautiful building. You know, it has lights for every, every function you might want to get nurses and get help. We have combination uh, locks to hit to get your tongue compressor out. Every kind of equipment you can imagine. My fifth patient of the, of the day was somebody, a child who had come from a distance, brought by his grandmother. His mother had died this spring, and the grandmother was caring for the child. He had about four medical issues that all needed time, and we were starting to talk about them, and uh, the, the grandmother started telling me, started going through the problem list, and, and I, I kind of stopped and I just said, so, but how are you doing? How are you doing? And she, she just stopped, and she started to cry, and she reached down, and I looked, looked I realized there was no Kleenex in the room. <laughs> we had all these gadgets, we had all these lights, we had every kind of equipment you could possibly want. No one had thought of putting Kleenexes in the room. <laughs> and we got, like, this washcloth. <laughs> but it just, you know, as, we're, as this building was being planned, <laughs> you know, for what is, what is the work of doctoring? Kleenexes were neglected, which I are used in my clinic about three times every clinic. Absolutely, I know. And given the kinds of um, situations that I know about your clinic, and I know you, you have that. And that's another great question about um, presence and suffering, um, you know, because we're in the problem stage tonight. So what are the actual obstacles to, to doing this, like to actually getting it done? And, you know, if there's no chairs in the room, it's very hard to sit. I have sat on the floor. Um, I drag chairs in, but there is, you go around this institution, this our institution, um, and it's very hard to find chairs. There's, uh, um, but, but it's the same institution that forgot to build a morgue when they, <laughs> and so it's, those are clues, right? to what, what is, what's the, like, what, what, what kind, what is our institution? Those are clues to the kinds of questions to ask, to be, a, to be as our good friend Jeff Bishop calls himself, a friendly cr critic, right? Oh, you should have, you should have built a morgue. I wonder what that says about your design, that you built no morgue. What does it say that there are no chairs? What does it say that there's no, no Kleenex? And these seem like small things. Well, they are small things, just like sitting down. But if we pay attention to small things and actually spend time, st stop and spend 10 minutes meditating about Kleenex. <laughs> and you might find something uh, through that one small, that might become a small portal into a very large question about how you make it possible to do the thing that y'all are trying to, to do. This is, this is real. The, if you're trying to answer the question, how do we actually do this? Mm -hmm. Last question. So, um, I don't think I needed it, but um, so I, I just started training a new nurse in our unit a couple weeks ago. She's 21, fresh out of college, small, beautiful, incredibly kind. Um, this week we were intubating a patient 
young female anal cancer. Um, we had been with her for several hours. She had diffuse lung injury from one of her chemotherapy agents. And this decision was made, we need to intubate. So she had been through a few intubations. I said, you know, are you okay to push the RSI drugs? She said, yeah. I was like, okay, I, I believe you. I'm gonna be here whenever the dose is, you know, it's medically safe. Um, patient was sitting up, she pushed the propofol, pushed the sucks, pushed a little bit of Neo, dropped the patient back. Patient's gown came up and the scarring on her perineum was horrific. She was literally falling apart. Um, and she just began to cry. Um, and she was sitting there weeping with phenylephrine like attached to the free-flowing IV. And the anesthesiologist looked at me and said, not the time. And he's right. This is not the time to have this sudden exit, you know, mourning because I mean, her blood pressure was like 60 something. We just pushed like 70 a probe. Um, so I, you know, stepped in, gave the bunch of phenol. We finished the RSI. Um, and afterwards, my charge nurse went up to her and said, we cry in the car. And later came to me and said, do you think she's gonna make it? And I struggled because no, you don't get to have an existential crisis in the middle of a rapid sequence of debation. It's not the time. But that's exactly the kind of person I wanna work with. Someone who doesn't have to be convinced of the beauty and the import of the human person. Someone who doesn't have to be you know, taught how to value things other than blood pressure. Um, I don't know if she's gonna make it because she cried. I don't know how to train her to make it through an RSI. I don't know how to train her to hold it together in front of family and at the same time, not bludgeon the sensibilities out of her. I think that is a fantastic, like that's probably a great point to close on, and here's why. Um, because that's a problem. That, that is a problem. And it is a problem at every level. The experience of decision making that led up to intubation of this patient with this horrific cancer. Um, what happened in, in that process? The experience of, um, of this nurse encountering the reality of her scars for the first time in the middle of crisis. Crisis is a terrible time to adjust to um, things that require a kind of existential engagement, um, compassion, weeping, talk, processing. Um, so why is, it, why is it that this wonderful young nurse um, was, um, and I'm asking this very generally, because uh, this happens all the time, and sometimes it's completely unavoidable, and I'm aware of that too. I've worked for years in emergency rooms where things, nothing you could do to, to stop. But is there anything um, about our awareness of what it is to be a 24-year-old person who has not yet had a lot of experience that might um, make us habitually talk with them beforehand, um, wherever it's possible, about the, nat the true nature, the real nature, not the sterilized, covered up, um, bandaged, you know, nice, neat tape, everything now looks nice and clean instead of like this horrific scarring in her perineum. But the horrific scarring in her perineum is the reality, right? Um, so how do, we, how do we help introduce people to reality and introduce them to ways to grasp reality even though we dress things up and make everything look clean, neat, and, 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 and sterile, right? And then the other thing um, is in that moment, I think it's a, it is a very reasonable thing to say this is not the moment. But the corollary to that is, but there will be a moment subsequent to this. And to recognize that this person is in training, right? This is not a, t you know what else it's not a moment for? It is not a moment to shame her or to tear her down. It is a moment to say, 
this is, we have to do some things. This person's trusting us to do some things, so this is not the moment. But there will be a moment, and for her to know there will be a moment, and for the culture to become a culture where there are subsequent moments, you know, where we will go to her, and instead of shaming, instead of questions of whether or not she'll make it, right? What happens instead is, um, that was beautiful. The idea that you were capable of experiencing such profound compassion and sorrow for her is very beautiful. And I also struggle with this. I'll tell you that with experience over time, one of the gifts that we give as nurses to our patients is that we learn how to see things that to the average person would be shocking. But we learn how to be present to these people without being distracted or diverted by this horrific deformity. We continue to see the person rather than the deformity. We become spiritually mature in our responsiveness to the human being in front of us so that no matter what the deformity is, we learn what to do with that. And that is a form of what we call wisdom. And that is the wisdom that grows among people that we trust our bodies to, right? And so someone who just doesn't care is like, what do I care? It's just tissue, right? I don't want that person caring for me. But at the same time, I want someone to be able to push the propofol. I don't want them to miss the sucks. I want them to get the paralysis. I want to be intubated well, but I want to be cared for. So helping her negotiate this thing, obviously you people are here because this is hard to negotiate. It's not like it's obvious how to do it. And so she's already ahead of the game because she at least has the hard part accomplished. She can see suffering and feel. Now she just needs to, to grow this other part. So I, 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 if, if she doesn't make it, it is not her fault. If she doesn't make it, it is because she was crushed by a system that doesn't know how to accommodate wisdom, right? We need to be clear on that. And then that's what y'all be talking about. Thank y'all so much. Y'all. Thanks.